And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's actually kind of nice to see so many friends and familiar faces in the audience. I think it's going to be a really fun conference. So yeah, we're good. Uh, yeah, today I'd like to talk to you about some of the machine learning and computer vision work that we're doing over at Flickr. And is this working? We have uh, almost sole vision, but not quite AV. <laughs> so these days, photography is pretty much ubiquitous. Um, because of smartphones, most of you guys probably have some kind of internet-connected camera um, in your pockets at all times. And so images and video are becoming more and more important, not just as a way to document events or as an art form, but also as a key means of everyday communication. Um, and so some of the goals we have at Flickr are to be a, a trusted place where you can store all of your visual memories, to be a place where you can come to share and discover beautiful content, and also a place where you can come to build image-based communities around common interests. And in support of that, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so in, in support of that, um, we already offer um, a couple of different things like a free terabyte of personal storage, and we've already got several billion um, publicly searchable images. And on my team, one of the things that we believe is that by adding uh, more sophisticated visual intelligence on top of that, we can give people an even better experience when they come to us. So the, uh, the outline for the rest of my talk is as follows. I'll, I'll begin by giving a, a brief overview of the deep net architecture that we use in our training process. Um, this is going to have to be pretty brief, but I'm hoping the general concepts will be familiar to most of you. Um, another point here is that I'm just going to focus on the deep learning part in my talk. Uh, my colleague Pierre, who's up next, is going to tell you a bit more about our end-to-end -end pipeline, and there's a couple of interesting things there. Uh, next, I'd like to share with you some results uh, from our model, so both in terms of the raw classifier outputs as tag suggestions, and also the ways in which this helps us improve the search experience. Uh, and then I'd actually like to say a little bit about um, the data we have at Flickr, um, and that's thanks to our, our awesome user community. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we're starting to be able to really leverage some of that. Um, and in particular, I'm going to show you some results from some recent work we've been doing on computational aesthetics, and then I'll, I'll wrap for the Q&A. So the architecture we're using is a pretty standard ConvNet. We have six layers of convolution and pooling with rectified linear nonlinearities. Um, and then that's followed by two fully connected layers. Um, the conv layers vary in thickness from about 100 channels deep at the, um, the layers close to the, the pixels, um, ranging to about 500 channels deep to, uh, to the deeper layers. Um, the first fully connected layer has about 8,000 units. The second has about 4,000. Um, and in total, that gives us, um, of the order, uh, 100 million parameters. Uh, something that's a little unusual for us is that we actually have a very large output for the first stage of training. A lot of people um, deal with outputs of, say, 1,000 classes. In our initial stage of training, we actually use uh, several tens of thousands um, of class labels. And that's actually um, more classes than we have in production right now. But one of the interesting things that we find is that by training the model initially on the much harder discrimination task, it helps us produce um, much better features and more refined features that, that help us when we come to focus on the, the smaller number of classes that, that we do care about. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, we do our training on GPUs using the, the CAFE framework. Um, and for learning, we're using um, SGD and Momentum. And um, yeah, as a quick plug, if you guys haven't played with CAFE yet, then um, I'd highly recommend that it. it's it's very nice to work with, um, very, very easy to kind of get it set and working. It's, um, it's out of the, um, the Berkeley group, and it's got a lot of support um, actively from, from those folks and from other folks outside. So for instance, um, my team at Flickr are also active contributors to that code base. Um, the training time for our model is um, about one to two weeks on a single GPU, um, although recently we've been exploring multi-GPU parallelism. And that speeds things up um, quite a bit. And again, that, that code is in the, the CAFE code base, and we're pushing those contributions back to the, the main repo. So if you're interested, you can, you can take a look at that. And also, we had a, a paper on some of our methodology there at the recent uh, NIPS deep learning workshop. So 
Once we're done with the initial softmax training, we actually retrain a bunch of independent binary classifiers on top of the uh, fully connected layer features. Um, and that's where we, we focus on the tags that we, we really care about in production at the moment. Um, yeah, as I, as I said, there's actually a, quite a lot of other stages that go from taking uh, one of these neural networks and turning it into a production system, and there's a lot of interesting challenges there, but as I said, Pierre, who will be speaking next, is gonna talk more about our end-to-end -end pipeline, so I'm, I'm not gonna go into much detail there. So, okay, next I'd like to show you some of the, the results from our initial classifier. Um, and basically, I, I just took a handful of images, and I'm gonna show you a couple of things where things are working pretty well, and also some where things are, are not working so well. Okay, so I hope everyone can see. Um, yeah, so the, the first image is, is working pretty well. Um, the dog is kind of jumping towards the camera, so it's not really in a very standard configuration, but we still managed to pick it up. Um, we're also getting the yard and the picket fence. And in the image on the right, um, you can see these pandas are doing something kind of weird and, and pandery. Pandas are strange animals. <laughs> um, but we still managed to pick that up. Uh, so here are two examples where we're basically correct, but some of the more fine-grained labels are a little bit off the mark. So um, for instance, the image on the right, um, we get the birds, the bird food, the bird feeder. Um, I'm not an expert on birds, so I actually had to check this myself, but um, it turns out that there are indeed house finches in that, those are the, the red ones, but um, the, the green guys in the foreground are not zebra finches. Um, Here's an example on people. Um, that's me on the left with a slightly different hairstyle. Um, and those labels are pretty much accurate, although I'm not sure I describe my hair as a pompadour. And uh, that's my girlfriend on the right-hand side. And our network thinks that she could be a model or a pinup, and I agree, so that's kind of awesome. <laughs> um, here's a couple of examples where we're not doing quite so well. Um, and across a corpus as big as ours, we are inevitably gonna make a lot of mistakes. And that's something that we're continually working hard to mitigate and control for. And again, I think Pierre is gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but yeah, you can see on the left here, um, we're coming up with sticks, twigs, um, stick insect, and a walking stick. And you can kind of see where those are coming from, particularly the walking stick. There's something that looks a lot like a cane on the right-hand side, but, but they're just not the right labels for that image. Likewise, on the right, um, the mistakes are understandable, but but they're not correct. Um, okay, so next up, um, yeah, I'd like to show you um, a couple of examples of how we can use the predictions from our models to, to help improve search um, quality and, and relevance. So I um, hope you guys can see clearly on the, in the image I'm showing two searches side by side. Um, on the left-hand side, it's just using the textual metadata, and on the right-hand side, it's using the metadata augmented with outputs from our visual classifiers. Um, and in this case, you know, both of them are pretty good, but if you look to the lower left, you can see that we start to lose relevance. In the first search, there's um, images of uh, bakeries, which you, know, you, you can see why they might have the word bread in the description, but it's not really what you're, you're looking for, whereas the image on the right, uh, much more focused, much more relevant. Um, here's another example, oops. Um, so in this case, the search was fox, and here the uh, improvement is much more marked. Um, so the images on the left um, all have um, fox in the description, but, but the search results there are, are really not relevant at all. But with the um, visual classifier, we can boost the relevance and, and really bring the images that presumably you'd actually be looking for if you, if you entered the term fox. So those were examples of public searches. Something that I think is kind of neat is um, personal searches, and that's the, the ability to do searches through your own private photo collection without having done any tagging at all. And as I was saying, you know, with the smartphones that people have these days, we're collecting more and more data. Uh, Flickr has a facility that lets you auto-upload things, and so there's this possibility of, you know, I'm just recording the world around me, capturing visual memories. I don't have to do any tagging, but I can then do descriptive content-based retrieval on photos I've taken without doing any work, and, and that, I, I think, is, is very exciting. Um, 
particularly in, in combination with some of our other search options. So, um, you know, you can localize searches um, by location, um, a lot of depends on GPS, um, color, date, time. It's, it's a really nice way to kind of dive back into your memories. Um, and again, we're not perfect there, and so one of the interesting challenges here is where do you put yourself on the precision recall curve? Um, do, you know, we can retrieve everything for you in a particular class, but we're gonna throw in some stuff that's not relevant, or do we err on the side of, we'll show you some of your dog photos, but maybe not all of them, but we'll try and you know, make sure that everything we show you is a dog, and those are kind of interesting um, UX challenges that we're still working through. Uh, yeah, so now I'd like to just take a, a quick moment to just kind of really expound on the, uh, the awesome data resources that we have at Flickr. And I, I feel very lucky to be working with it because it, it, it's a fantastic corpus of images in terms of like the scale, the diversity, and the quality. We have about 10 billion images in total, <coughs> excuse me, and some of them are absolutely beautiful. Um, it's also nice that the images that, that are uploaded have um, a really easy and flexible range of licensing options. So we have about 300 million Creative Commons images, um, which I think is the largest collection in the world. And um, if you're interested in playing with some of this data, um, we recently released a um, subset of 100 million Creative Commons images in a format that's pretty easy for researchers to grab and, and work with. And so if you're interested in that, you can uh, chat to me about that later. A um, couple of other things. Um, so as I said, not all of our photos are tagged, and one of the things we're moving toward is you know, people tagging less and less of the, the photos that they take. But again, given the sheer scale of our corpus, we have still a huge amount of curated images. Um, and that's on top of the kind of automatic metadata, such as GPS. Um, other things that are kind of neat and interesting to work with, we have about two million groups, and these are basically user communities centered around um, interests and themes in, in a visual way. Um, and we've also got um, a pretty rich social graph um, and different kinds of interactions, and those also allow us to infer some really interesting signals. So my point with all of this is that um, we can leverage all these different data sources in interesting ways and basically improve our algorithms to give value back to our users. And I'd say that that's something that we're, we're really only just getting started with. There was a, a lot of infrastructure work to kind of um, get to where we are now, but I think you're gonna see a lot of um, very interesting developments coming from us in the, in the next year. And so up next, I'd like to give you a quick example of one of those projects, and that's where we're using uh, deep nets to infer aesthetic properties of images. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if we, um, if we restrict our attention to images that have had a lot of interactions on the site, so you know, many, many views or other kinds of comments or interactions, then it turns out that we can use uh, that interaction data and come up with some heuristics that correlate really quite well with subjective judgments of aesthetic quality. And that's kind of interesting because what it means is that we can take our corpus, compute those heuristic scores, and then train a deep network to predict those heuristic scores. Um, and then once we've got the trained model, we can apply that to images that haven't had many interactions. <clears throat> um, so effectively, it's kind of nice. It allows us to build a model that can estimate the perceived beauty of an image directly from the pixels and without any feature engineering. <clears throat> so in this slide, I'm showing some results from a, a model that we trained in that way, and I'm, I basically took um, a couple of representative examples from three different buckets. The top row are the best quality images, the, the most beautiful, if you will. Uh, the middle row are intermediate quality, and the, the bottom row are, are lower quality. Um, and you know, obviously, everyone has a different notion of um, what beauty is, but I, I think most people would more or less agree with those assessments that the, the, the top row are really beautiful images, and the bottom row are more kind of pedestrian snapshots. Um, apologies if those are any of your photographs. <laughs> um, and this is cool for a couple of different reasons. Um, on the one hand, there's a, a lot of practical things that we can do with it. So we can you know, surface content from up and coming photographers who may not have that many followers. So kind of avoiding the cold start problem. Um, we can use it to influence search rankings in cases where we don't have enough 
real human judgments. But I, I personally think that this is kind of neat just in of itself. A lot of people, maybe not so much in this room, but I think a lot of people on the street would feel that um, the, the perception of beauty is something that is a, a very uniquely human trait, whereas it's kind of neat that we can, we can teach machines to do it if we, if we have enough data. And I think that's an interesting dimension to consider um, in terms of, you know, what does the interaction of AI and art look like in, say, 10, 20 years, you know, when we're on this uh, rapid progress curve? And I, I think there's going to be a lot of very cool developments there. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, still looking to the future, um, and on a shorter time scale, what's next for us? And I'm actually going to go through this um, fairly quickly so that there's, there's time for questions. Um, but, yeah, th there's lots of work still to do, and um, we're kind of interested in making fundamental algorithmic improvements across the board. Um, I, there's a couple of different areas. I, I won't go into all those details. I think one area that's particularly interesting and promising is, is the richness of the models that we're using. So right now, we and a lot of other people are using basically feed-forward nets. Um, I see a lot of potential in expanding the, the richness of those models. Um, and two areas, one is kind of moving away from categorical labels to making predictions in some kind of um, distributed semantic space, and another is um, employing techniques like reinforcement learning instead of supervised learning. Next slide. Cool, so thanks. Uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, I'd just like to say a, a big thank you to the uh, awesome science and engineering team at Flickr, um, and as well as some of our collaborators um, from the rest of Yahoo and Labs. Um, and I'd be happy to take some questions. the jumping dog, mm -hmm. uh, if somebody had been holding, you know, like a treat above its head as it jumped, how, f or can you just talk about the challenges and what you guys are looking at in terms of more conceptual tags like dog trick or, you know, or even the concept of a treat versus just a piece of meat? So you, you said treat and not tree, right? Treat, yeah, like <laughs> holding up like a little piece of meat or something like that. Um, yeah, so the, the treat itself, um, with the resolution we work at at least, probably wouldn't get picked up just because the, there wouldn't necessarily be enough pixels for that. Um, in terms of more conceptual stuff, that's definitely something that we're, we're able to learn. Like, I, I don't think, for instance, we, we have dog trick, but, um, you know, actions such as um, running, for instance, we were, were able to pick up on. So, um, yeah, there's a, a, at some point, I think um, it becomes a question of what kinds of labels we use and how we want to interpret images. So um, the categorical labels that we're using now, I, I think, work pretty well. But going to that kind of full scene understanding and being able to come up with these kind of rich compositional descriptions, we probably want to take a slightly different approach in terms of how we're predicting. Um, can't quite see, so I guess just speak up. <laughs> Um, early on, you uh, showed some uh, classification errors, some image class classification errors, and I was wondering what kind of strategies you guys use to try to uncover those. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think Pierre may, may well be talking a lot about this, so I, I don't want to steal too much of his thunder, but um, we, one of the things we built was um, a dashboard where we effectively have a human in the loop to, to audit some of these. Um, there are... There are, there are some automated ways that we can do that, both in terms of just um, figuring out the precision and recall, and then also kind of doing a statistical analysis of the, the kinds of um, things we're getting right and not right. But um, yeah, it, it, I think that's one of those interesting places where, you know, in an academic setting, you kind of don't care because your score is your score, and you know, an error is an error. But when you're putting something in front of users, it's not just the proportion of things you're getting right, but the kinds of things you get right, and particularly the kind of things you get wrong, really matter a lot. Where are we now? Mm -hmm. what, two parts. What type of experts do you use as inputs, if any, uh, in teaching uh, perception of aesthetic beauty, and then? What are the implications for generating aesthetic beauty on the other end? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but both great questions. Um, so this is fairly early work. So um, 
For the uh, for generating the signals, there's there's kind of two two forms there. Uh, as I said, for images that have been on the site for a while and we have um, a fair amount of interaction data, we can um, there are a whole bunch of measures that we can um, make. And so once once we have those, we can come up with a hypothesis of how those might relate to to beauty, and then we can validate that either you know. The, the initial work was just basically my own taste, but then there's also, you, you can kind of crowdsource this and you know, put it out to a crowd and kind of get consensus agreements. Uh, but really, I think, I think the nice thing is, once, once we've validated um, those heuristic decisions, we're able to get this data at massive scale just because of the, the, the corpus that we have. Um, and then the second question in terms of generating aesthetic beauty, I, I think that's super, super interesting. Um, you know, if once you have a system that can um, evaluate something, then you know an obvious next step is okay. Let's build a system that learns to create stuff and train the creator on the scores of the evaluator, and in that way see, see what's interesting. So that's actually probably not something that we'll do at Flickr, but that's a kind of art project that I'm personally looking into. So. Yeah, you know that, that, that's a great question as well. Um, I I haven't had a chance to look at that yet, but I'm yeah I'm very interested to to see that. Perfect. Well, I we're I'm sure all waiting to hear what Pierre has to say. Where uh, some of these technical details, I'm very interested in knowing how you deal with all the tags and missing tags and so forth. Yeah. Covered, but I'll hold that question and thank you again so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>